to allow for bacteria to, uh, to take that DNA up. So to illustrate this process, we'll zoom in on this conjugation uh, exchange of, bacteria, of DNA between bacteria. So here are those bacteria uh, in a little bit of a different way. And so this donor cell is providing this DNA here with the arrows uh, to a recipient cell. And the recipient cell will take this DNA in and it will insert it into its chromosome. And so now the recipient bacteria has picked up some new genetic material but it wants to uh, mitigate those risks, right? So it needs to make sure that it wants to express this DNA before, yeah, um, before it decides that it wants to keep it. And so to uh, uptake this DNA, the uh, bacteria have this protein HMS, which can bind to uh, this newly acquired DNA, and through protein-protein interactions can coat all of this DNA to form filaments. And HMS can work with these other proteins that I mentioned, STPA and HHA, to form these filaments. And this HMS filament uh, will silence the gene by preventing uh, at least two steps in transcription. It can block promoters, so preventing initiation, and it also can affect um, elongating RNA polymerase that might encounter the filament. So when I started in the lab, we didn't know very much about uh, these different kinds of filaments and the details of how they're affecting transcription. And so really there was a big question of what is the mechanism of silencing by HMS? So to answer this big question, I focused my thesis research down on a two-part question. I asked what is the structure of HMS and mixed HMS filaments and how do they regulate transcript elongation? So today, I will tell you a little bit about what we knew about how HMS can form filaments and how they affect um, elongating RNA polymerase, um, which was known when I started in the lab. And then I'll tell you a few more details about um, investigations I did into the structure of these mixed filaments where HMS and HHA are interacting with each other. And then I will uh, finally end with what, uh, what the cell gets from these diverse filaments. So HMS is a small 15 kilodalton protein and it has two domains, an N-terminal oligomerization domain and a C-terminal DNA binding domain. And these are connected by a flexible linker. So there's no full length structure of this protein, but we do have structures of the individual domains. So I'll first show you the oligomerization domain, which um, I'm showing you a few of the HMS monomers here uh, in the different colors. So the red one here is one monomer and the tan one is the second. <coughs> and these um, oligomerization domains would have a DNA binding domain coming off here. I'm showing in the circles. But the, what the structure told us about the oligomerization domain is that it can facilitate uh, different protein-protein interactions between HNS monomers. Uh, it can form dimers at this site in the middle, and the second site facilitates longer oligomerizations of HNS. So there's a separate structure of the HMS DNA binding domain, which I'm showing you here, uh, interacting with the short DNA uh, duplex. And this DNA binding domain uh, binds into the minor group of DNA, and it binds to mostly AT-rich sequences. And while it can bind AT-rich sequences uh, more generally, it has been documented to have a high affinity for a 10-base pair sequence, uh, <coughs> I'm showing you here, uh, where the key feature are these T's and A's in the middle. So together between these uh, DNA binding domain structures and the oligomerization domain, we know that HMS can bind DNA um, and form filaments, but we really, we really are lacking a full length structure of these proteins. So I want to tell you a little bit more about these filaments and what they look like. So we know that HMS can form filaments throughout the E. coli genome. And I'm showing you here some uh, chip signal from HMS binding throughout the genome, which is shown on this circle here. And so each of these peaks are HMS binding sites. And these regions vary in length, but they're averaging about two kilobases long. And so HMS can bind over various regions in the DNA, or in the genome. And we know from in vitro studies that HMS can adopt two different conformations. It can adopt a, or form a linear filament, which is where HMS binds to just one uh, segment of DNA. And this is in contrast to the second confirmation, the bridge filament, where HMS can bind to two segments of DNA. 
And I'm showing you cartoons for these filaments here because we really have a lot of questions about what these filaments look like. We don't have a structure of the full like protein, and so it's difficult to imagine how all of these monomers can arrange themselves within either the linear or the bridge filaments. And so I'll also mention here that HMS is not acting alone. Instead, it is modulated by HHA and other factors. So I want to tell you a bit now about what we know about HHA. So HHA is a even smaller, even smaller protein. It is only about 80 kilodaltons, and it lacks a DNA binding domain, but rather its single domain is similar to the HNS oligomerization domain. And when I joined the lab, um, a structure came out showing how HNS can interact with HHA. And so this is the structure here, and there are two um, portions of HMS monomers interacting with the HHA shown in blue. And so if we were to take this interaction between HHA and HMS and assume that they're interacting together to form what I'm calling a mixed filament, so a mixture of HMS and HHA, it might look something like this, where the blue circles are HHA that I've added into the bridged HMS filament. And so, like with the HNS alone filaments, we had a lot of questions about what this overall filament might look like. So before I get into the structural work that I did to investigate these filaments, I want to tell you another reason why we care about these different filaments, and that's how they affect transcription. So I want to go back to my operon and tell you a little bit more about what we know about how HNS can affect transcription and how it affects all the stages of transcription. So in the first step of initiation, HMS can form filaments over the promoter that could be bridged or they could be linear. And I'm just showing you the two conformations here with different colors, so it's easy to see that in the bridged, HMS is interacting with two DNAs, but in the linear, HMS only binds to one DNA. So, now, HMS can block RNA primaries binding to the promoter, but it can also affect the second step of transcription, elongation, where an elongating RNA polymerase might encounter an HMS filament in either a linear or a bridged conformation. And a previous postdoc in the lab, Matt Kalayich, he investigated the interaction between RNA polymerase and these two conformations of HMS filaments, and he found that only this bridged filament can stimulate causing an RNA polymerase. And this pausing is a normal uh, part of elongation where RNA polymerase will dwell at certain sequences throughout the DNA. And this pausing can be enhanced by a variety of factors, including the bridge HNS filament. And so this pausing, uh, stimulation of pausing, causes RNA polymerase to dwell at that sequence for even longer and delays uh, RNA polymerase from getting to the very end of the DNA. And in addition to slowing down elongation overall, this pause RNA polymerase is a substrate for the last step of transcription termination, where this bridged HNS filament can increase the number of termination events that happen in a gene. So together, these three effects of HNS on RNA polymerase result in overall gene sidelining. And so my question, uh, coming into the lab, one of them, was to investigate how HHA might affect HNS activity. And so, like I mentioned, Matt, a previous postdoc, had investigated the effects of these filaments on elongation, and so I wanted to use the same assay to ask what this HHA-HNS mixed filament might be doing to RNA polymerase. So to do these experiments, we wanted an example uh, operon for that HNS might be regulating, and the bagel operon was a really good option for us. This operon typically um, or is used to make enzymes the cell can utilize beta glucosides as a nutrient source. And here I'm showing you a portion of what that operon looks like. And the key features I want to point out are that there are two regions in these gray boxes that HNS can bind to. And this results in formation of an HNS filament over the promoter for the bagel operon. And this results in silencing of the bagel operon. The second thing I want to point out is that there is a promoter downstream of this filament that I've labeled P on, and Jason Peters, who was a grad student in the lab, um, identified this promoter, and if RNA polymerase were to initiate at this promoter, transcription would be headed into the HNS filament. And so this 
from uh, Jean, this app where I'm providing us uh, a way to ask two questions about h &S and these mixed filaments. The first is, what is the effect of h &S on an elongating RNA polymerase? And the second is to ask more structural questions about what these filaments look like. So I want to talk first about the effect of h &S on elongating RNA polymerase, um, which focuses in on this situation, where RNA polymerase would be transcribing into the h &S filament. And so we developed an in vitro assay to look at this. And so we could poise RNA polymerase downstream of a filament, either the bridge or the linear or any combination we could come up with. And um, we could then perform elongation through the filament by adding uh, NTPs, RNA polymerase substrate, and RNA polymerase will then transcribe down the template. It will pause at various locations before it reaches the end of the template, creating the full-length RNA product. And so we can look at RNA polymerase's progression through these different filaments, or in the absence of filaments, to see how filaments affect transcription. So I want to show you first the effect of these two filaments on RNA polymerase. So the bridged h &S in the red and the linear h &S filament in the purple. And I'm showing you here the RNA is made um, in the presence of these different filaments at one time point. And so the RNA length is on the x-axis here, and the abundance of those RNAs is on the y-axis. And so at this time point, if uh, the RNA numerous has made it down the template, it could make a longer RNA, which I'm showing you here in the black trace, which is RNA polymerase transcribed in bare DNA. And when RNA polymerase is in the presence of this, or transcribing through this bridge h &S filament in the red, we noticed that there were shorter RNAs in higher abundance than uh, without any filament present. But this effect went away in the presence of the linear h &S filament, the purple trace here, which looks a lot like transcription of bare DNA. So from this experiment, we concluded that the bridged h &S filament was preventing uh, productive uh, movement of RNA polymerase down the template by stimulating pausing RNA polymerase at these sites. But this was not occurring in the linear filament. So I wanted to ask what happens to transcription when we add HHA to these different filaments. So I'm leaving my bridged and linear h &S results at the top. And now we compare this to the HHA HMS filament. Uh, we see some different effects. So again, I'm showing you the RNA length on the X axis and the RNA abundance on the Y axis, comparing transcription of bare DNA in the black uh, linear HMS filament in the purple, which again has little to no effect on RNA polymerase. But this HHA HMS filament in the blue only um, allows RNA polymerase to make really short RNAs. So these are, you know, less than 64 nucleotides long, whereas these were about 10 times that length. And so the presence of these really short RNAs suggested to us that the HHA HMS filament is also blocking um, RNA polymerase progression by stimulating pausing. And so it might be a bridged HMS filament since we knew, or a bridged filament since we knew that bridged HMS filaments could stimulate pausing. So it was really this uh, transcription result, seeing differences between bridge and linear filaments, that drove the question that I had spent most of my thesis work uh, addressing was, what is the structure of these filaments? Uh, and so this is a really big question to investigate the structure. And so I'm just going to tell you about two aspects that I investigated um, the structure of these proteins. And so first I want to tell you about the effect HHA has on HNS filaments and then tell you a bit more about the arrangement of the monomers within those filaments. And I'll just continue to show you this image to remind you that these two different conformations of h &S filaments can have different effects on RNA polymerase during transcription. Okay, so I want to first tell you how I investigated the structure of these HHA h &S filaments. So I used a technique called atomic force microscopy. And this allows me uh, to form individual filaments and visualize them on a surface. And so I can mix some DNA with h &S to form something like this bridge filament or maybe a linear filament. And I can take these molecules and I can apply them to a surface. And so this is one of my real life samples. And the DNA protein complexes are on the top of this small square kind of sticking out on the face. You can't see them here with your eyes, but if you put them 
in the AFM, which looks like this, this instrument will allow us to see any changes in the height of molecules on a surface. So I take this surface here, and I put it in the um, AFM, and so now the surface is this bumpy green blob, so my molecules, and there's a tip shown in the blue, which will tap along this surface. And so the tip is going to be tapping along at the same rate if the surface is flat, but if there's any changes in the height, that tip will pick up those changes, and then they are detected by this laser, and then the computer can turn this changes in height and the ability for the tip to tap on the surface, and I can get an image that looks like this. And in this image, all of the dark uh, colors, these uh, black or red, are the surface, and any molecules that are on the surface would appear as this white uh, or light orange color, meaning that they were high off of the surface. And so in this image, I'm showing you two DNA molecules, which are uh, pointed out by these white arrows. So this is one squiggle of a DNA molecule, and this is a separate molecule. And so these DNAs, when they're just by themselves on the surface, can adopt this um, conformation, uh, which is kind of like a squiggle, because of the properties of DNA. And we can use this to compare what HNS, or HHA and HNS, uh, how they're interacting with the DNA. And so if we compare this DNA alone image to um, the sample where I added a low concentration of HNS, I can observe formation of the bridged HNS filaments. And I'm showing you in this image four of those bridged filaments. And I want to point out a few key features. And so the bridged filaments, um, the number one thing was that there were two DNA molecules. And I could see those by looking at the very ends of these molecules, where they look kind of like a V, meaning that there's two DNA molecules there. And these DNAs are bound by protein, um, which I observed with these um, whiter spots, meaning they are higher off of the surface, and the two DNAs seem to be very close together so that I can't resolve them. And so we concluded that that was where HNS was finding these DNAs, allowing them to be brought together. But there were some areas of those filaments that were separate, these kind of loops, where HNS either wasn't bound or fell apart when we made the samples. But in these conditions, we could observe these bridged HNS filaments where two DNA molecules were being brought together by HNS. So I also could form filaments at a higher HNS concentration which we determined formed linear filaments, which look like this. And in this image, there are two linear filaments with the blue, I'm pointing with the blue arrows here. So this is one molecule, and this is the second. And these linear filaments could be identified uh, because they were straighter than the DNA alone. So if we compare how straight this molecule is to these two over here, the HNS is stiffening the DNA in the linear filament. And I also didn't see any of the Vs at the end of the DNA that I saw in the bridge filament, suggesting that there was indeed only one DNA molecule bound by HNS. So we could form these two different HNS filaments by varying the HNS concentration, and I wanted to know if either of these filament conformations were present when I added HHA to these HNS filaments. So here are my HNS filaments. Again, and so if I added HHA to either of these filaments, I observed a variety of different molecules, including this one, um, showing as an example. And this molecule is quite large and very high off of the surface. And so if you just compare these scale bars, which are all the same length, the HHA HNS is much larger than these filaments over here. And in addition to my fortune, a little bridge filament landed over here next to my HHA and HNS filament. So you can even see in one image how much bigger this HHA and HNS filament is. OK, so I spent a long time staring at these images. You know, one, this example, other ones. What is going on? What is this filament? And what we determined at the end was that HHA was facilitating lots of bridging events, so a multi-bridge filament which I'm showing uh, with this cartoon down here, where the DNA in the black can be interacting with the different oligomers of these HNS HHA complexes. And so all these different interactions can facilitate uh, formation of a bridge complex with more than two DNAs in them. So from this experiment, I concluded that HHA is indeed stimulating bridging by HNS. So it's either increasing the amount of bridge 
uh, interactions that are already present in a bridge filament, or it's switching this linear filament to a more bridge confirmation. So I want to bring this back to the transcription result I showed you at the beginning. So what were the effects of these filaments on transcription? So I'm showing you those results here again. These are the same ones I showed earlier. Uh, showing that the bridged HNS filament in the red and the HHA HNS filament can stimulate pausing, but the linear filament here in purple does not. And so these transcription results where some filaments stimulate pausing but others do not is consistent with the results we observed with AFM, showing that bridged HNS or the bridged HHA HNS filaments can stimulate pausing, but linear filaments cannot. So this provides some structural information about what filaments are able to affect the transcription machinery during elongation. So to summarize this first part, I use atomic force microscopy to visualize these different filaments, the linear HNS, the bridged HNS, and the HHA HNS filament. And I found that HHA can modulate the conformation of HNS filaments. So I've added this HHA arrow here to show that HHA can convert a linear filament into a bridge filament or continue to stabilize that bridge filament. And I'll just remind you again that it's this bridge filament that can inhibit or affect the elongating RNA polymerase, but the linear filament only seems to affect initiating RNA polymerase. Okay, so that was the first part of my structural investigations into these filaments. And now I want to talk about my second question, kind of zooming in on these filaments and looking a little more carefully at how are these molecules arranged. So we're going to zoom in on the DNA binding interactions between HNS and the DNA, which, um, despite the fact that HNS is a DNA binding protein, aren't really well characterized. And so going into this investigation, I had a distinct hypothesis. Uh, I hypothesized that the arrangement of the DNA binding domains might be different in a bridge and a linear filament. And so there was a little bit of data that went into drawing these cartoons, but at the end of the day, we thought that maybe in a bridge filament, the spacing between these DNA binding domains might be larger than the spacing in the linear filament here. So I'm just showing you that difference with those arrows. So we thought if we could see this difference in the DNA binding domain, then would give us a uh, more of a clue how the molecules of HNS are arranged within these filaments. So to look at the DNA binding domain location, I added a probe to the DNA binding domain that looks like this. So here we're going back to that structure of the DNA binding domain, but I'm showing it in purple now. Um, and I attached this iron EDTA moiety to the HNS DNA binding domain. And the reason we picked this is because iron uh, can perform a number of reactions, including the Fenton reaction, by reacting with hydrogen peroxide, and it generates this very reactive hydroxyl radical species. And this hydroxyl radical can interact um, with the DNA, and it can re uh, result in DNA cleavage. And because this iron is attached to the HNS DNA binding domain in my system, this DNA cleavage is limited to a small area right around where the iron is. And so in this experiment, if I'm observing DNA cleavage, it is because free radicals were generated by the iron, which is attached to the DNA binding domain, meaning that HNS was bound to the DNA. So said another way, I can only observe DNA cleavage if HNS is bound to the DNA, because that's where the iron is. Okay, so I wanted to look again at our filaments that I could form on the vagal opera, like I showed you with the AFM. And so those were large filaments, and so I'm now going to zoom in on one area of this filament to look at about a 100 base pair region of this filament and look at where HNS is bound to the DNA. So I can form my filaments with my labeled HNS, which is now purple, and in this case also a linear filament. And I can add the hydrogen peroxide, which will generate those free radicals and result in DNA cleavage within the filament, again, nearby the DNA binding domains. And I can then observe these cleavage events by running these DNAs, which have been labeled on a gel. And so here is my one and only gel for my talk to show you these different cleavage events. And so at the top, I'm showing you the DNA 
by itself with no agent. So you have one DNA product that's this big black blob at the top. And if I add in my iron labeled HMS, what I observe is all of these different shorter DNA products. And it seems to be in nearly every base on the DNA. But I did notice that some of these bases were cut more than others. Those, bright, those bands were much brighter. <laughs> but I couldn't really tell from looking at this gel what was going on. And so I quantified this uh, to investigate how much each base is being cut on the DNA. And during that quantification, I can get a graph that looks like this, where the location of the base is on the x-axis, and the y-axis is showing me uh, bases that have less cleavage to more cleavage. And what I observed was there were distinct bases that were being cut more than others. And so I've indicated those with these red arrows here. So this probably doesn't look anything like h and binding to DNA to many people, including myself for a while. <laughs> so we wanted a way to investigate or turn this cleavage pattern into an arrangement of h and on the DNA ring to address our original question. So to determine where h and is binding to the DNA, I had to do um, a few other things. So I took the cleavage pattern that I just showed you before and combined it with the cleavage pattern on the other strand of the double-stranded DNA. And then I also worked with um, Daniel Rostin, who was a postdoc in our lab for just a little bit of time. Um, and he helped me do some molecular dynamic simulations to basically predict where this iron EDTA bound to h &S might cut the DNA. And I wish I had time to tell you about all the great work he did, but I'm just going to tell you he did it, and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and because he did that great work, I could then build a model of h &S binding to DNA, which looks like this, where the DNA is in gray, and the DNA binding domains are in this purple surface representation. And I'm showing you the iron again, just so you know, that's how I put this together. And so these DNA binding domains are in a very regular arrangement on the DNA, meaning that h &S is occupying these sites um, in all of the filaments that formed in my solution. So I told you my first experiment was looking at a linear h &S filament. And my hypothesis was that the linear bridge might be different. So my next question was, is the pattern of binding the same in a bridge filament? Is it the same as what I've shown here? So here's my cleavage pattern again that I got from a linear h &S filament. And with the help of my predecessor, Christine Hussmeyer, who's going to be amazing at h &S for the next few years, she helped me do this experiment where we could add HHA to stimulate bridging, which I already showed you the AFM, which was pretty convincing in showing that HHA prefers to form a bridge filament. So by adding HHA, we could form this bridge filament and look at the cleavage pattern in this filament. And here in green is that cleavage pattern, which looks pretty much the same as the linear filament. To my surprise, <laughs> I was so surprised and also very happy. And so from this result, um, I concluded that the DNA binding domain must be in the same arrangement in both a bridge and a linear filament to generate the same cleavage pattern. So I'll show you my model again and say that this model um, represents where we think the DNA binding domain is found in both a bridge and a linear filament, which was different than my original hypothesis. And so we needed some other explanation. How, so we need an estimation for how h &S is switching between this bridge and linear conformation. So I looked to the literature, and it turns out there's a number of other groups who study h &S, of course, it's an interesting protein. Um, and there's one paper um, from some colleagues of ours, uh, Raymond Stain's group, they published in 2017, which suggested that h &S can adopt different conformations. So I just want to illustrate those with a cartoon. So the first confirmation I observed was called an open confirmation. And so if you were to look at one h &S dimer here, so the red and yellow are monomers forming a, dim a dimer, in this open confirmation, both of the DNA binding domains, and in particular, the residues of h &S, uh, that can bind into the minor group, which I'm showing in the gray, are open and available for binding DNA. So in this confirmation, h &S could bind to two separate DNA molecules. The second confirmation Raymond Stang's group observed was the closed confirmation, where one of the DNA binding domains um, moves and now it's in a 
interacting with the entrenormal domain of the protein as, and is in essence sequestered and unable to bind to DNA. So in this closed confirmation, only one of the DNA binding domains would be available for binding DNA. And so this, uh, these two confirmations fit into our idea of the bridge and the linear filaments, respectively. And so to put these two confirmations in our filaments, we can add the closed confirmation HNS into our linear filament because only one DNA is bound by HNS. And so here are closed confirmation HNSs regularly arranged in our linear filament. And this open confirmation could explain how HNS binds to two DNAs in a bridged filament here, where two DNA binding domains are able to bind to two separate DNAs. And again, the spacing between the DNA binding domains is the same between these two filaments. So our hypothesis that the spacing of the DNA binding domains between these two proteins uh, was not working out from my experience, but rather it suggested that since the DNA binding domains are in the same arrangement, this other conformational change in the protein could facilitate one or two DNAs bound by HNS filament. And again, the switch between the bridge and the layer can be facilitated by proteins such as HHA. So my work investigating the structure of these filaments showed two things. One, HHA can stimulate bridging by HNS. And also that the DNA binding domains are arranged the same between bridged and linear filaments, suggesting a conformational change happening in HNS to facilitate binding one or two DNAs. And again, these filaments have different effects on gene expression, where the bridge filament seems to be responsible for affecting elongating RNA polymerases, whereas the linear filament can only affect this initiating RNA polymerase. And so these different effects of HNS filaments on transcription um, kind of put together a model for us. And the model is that modulating the conformation of HNS so whether or not one or two DNA binding domains are available allows the cell to tune how it regulates gene expression. It can facilitate either inhibiting initiation or affecting elongation, um, all by modulating the HNS conformation. So I told you about one way in which HNS can be modulated, and that's by the protein HHA, which stimulates bridging. It turns out there's a bunch of other factors that can modulate the activity of HNS, including the second protein, STPA, the paralog of HNS, which also stimulates bridging by HNS. And there are at least, at least three other factors that can modulate the conformation of HNS. And work from many others in the field have um, recently identified that nearly all of these factors can change the conformation of HNS in a similar way to what I showed you before. And it's this change in HNS confirmation which changes how, how HNS is regulating gene expression. And so together, my work helps put together this picture of modulating the confirmation of HNS can modulate the effect that HNS has on gene expression. So I want to bring this back to our horizontal gene transfer situation. So I told you this process is important for bacteria to pick up new genetic material. And the material that it's picking up is very diverse. Right? It might encounter bacteria that were encountered before and therefore new genetic material. So all of this DNA, this transfer gene here, um, could need to be regulated by a variety of different ways. And what these bacteria possess is a host of different kinds of filaments and modulators that can silence different kinds of genes. And so by having this diverse pool of filaments, the bacteria can silence a diverse pool of acquired genes. And so I just want to end with kind of a bigger picture question. What does it take to understand a bacterial chromatin? I think Bob mentioned this at the beginning. I was like really excited starting med school. Like, I can figure all this stuff out. It's going to be great. But like, it turns out that these questions are really hard to answer. <laughs> really hard. And I have to look a little bit. So, so many. I wrote a whole chapter on it. It's a lot. But what I did find was that these different filament conformations can silence genes in different ways. And in order to figure that out, I had to use a bunch of different techniques. And I only told you about two in detail, the AFM 
and my um, cleavage assay, in addition to our mutual transcription assay, but I did a bunch of other stuff that I didn't really get to talk about today. And all those experiments together have um, taken us steps towards understanding what these filaments look like and what they're doing to interact with our nucleus and silent <coughs> But what I've done is only one small portion of all of these spectrochromatin proteins, right? I looked at HMS, which silences genes. But there are a bunch of other chromatin proteins, like at least 13 of them, maybe more. And we still have a lot of questions about how they interact with DNA and how they can regulate gene expression. And so I think what I've learned from my thesis work is that it really takes a lot of different strategies to get at these complex questions of understanding how gene regulation occurs inside of a bacterial cell. Okay, so with that, I have a ton of people I have to thank. <laughs> so science does not happen like on your own. You know how they say it takes a village to raise a kid, like it takes a village to get the thesis. So um, I need to first thank everybody in the Landic Lab who have been amazing people to come and to work with every single day. Um, there are many people in the lab now, many people who have been in the lab since I've been here, and they've all been wonderful people to work with. Um, I need to thank my committee, who have met with me once a year and provided valuable suggestions for directions to go with my project, um, and just been generally supportive. Every time I met with them, I felt like, I can keep doing this. This is great. <laughs> um, I have a few specific people I need to thank for uh, project-related things. Um, Katie, one of my classmates, made me a reagent so I could do AFN, so I'm glad to have organic chemist friends. Um, Kevin, who is here, was helpful in analyzing some chip seek data that I didn't show you today. Um, and then the Morse Lab next door have been invaluable resources for things that I didn't know how to do, like run a nice gel to resolve base pair cleavage events on DNA. And so Wilma and Albert both were incredibly helpful for that. And I probably would not have been able to do those experiments without them, so thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. I also need to thank Kate and all the biochem people who make sure that I like check things off my list when I'm too busy thinking about science and forget to do any sort of paperwork. So they're wonderful. And Kate, who came in with me the last one, the class of 2012, one, we're here. We're here. <laughs> Kate and I started at the same time. You did. great. Okay, um, so I just wanted to share one story about Bob because he shared one story or more about me. This is one of my favorite pictures of Bob, and it's the shirt that Bob is wearing. And I feel like this like embodies Bob's attitude about science, which I have come to appreciate. Bob loves doing science. It's great. It is your passion, and I love that about you. And I'm remembering this conference we went to, a prescription meeting in 2017, and we all like flew in and drove up to the meeting in the middle of nowhere, Vermont, together. And then the first event is this like cocktail hour. And so we're all there, like ready, socializing with people. And Bob shows up with this shirt on, which I've never seen before. And I've, I've seen Bob's shirts. I think I know most of your shirts. <laughs> I have not seen this one before. So I lean over and I'm like, guys, what is the shirt Bob is wearing? Have you seen this before? No, no, what is it? So I'm just, walk over to Bob, Bob, what is this shirt? And you're like, it's my party shirt. <laughs> because we were at a conference and it was party time. It was like time to like interact with our colleagues and socialize and just have fun and learn about what other people are doing in science. And I, no, he was all week. <laughs> all week at the conference. Good question. Yeah, but then as soon as the conference was over, the party shirt came off because it was time to get back to work. <laughs> And I think I will always remember that. All the conversations we've had about you know, getting science done and doing it the right way have been invaluable. And I don't think that I'd be the scientist I am today without you. So thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. And thank you for letting me be in the lab and like doing all this stuff and trying things out and failing miserably for a number of years and things. So. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so Bob has been great. I also have to thank the HNS support group, as I call them. Um, so just like HMS, monomers have to interact together to silence genes. There's many people that have been involved in getting this project to work. So I have to thank the alumni of the project, uh, Matt Kalaj, uh, who I don't think I would have a PhD without him because he put together this in vitro transcription assay which allowed me to work on stuff. And he taught me how to do things, how to work with HMS, how to do these complicated in vitro assays. 
Um, Daniel was an undergrad in the lab who started like one month before I did, and he purified STPA, which took him like six months. So I felt bad for him, but he did it, and then I got to do experiments because he did stuff too. Um, and then finally, Eric, who was the in vivo side of the HNS group, and his cat Linus, who was just as supportive to him as he was to me. Um, so these people have been invaluable for getting my project going in the lab. <clears throat> Um, I also need to thank our group um, in, at Leiden University. Um, Ravis invited me over to do experiments with uh, a mom grad student in the lab. I took this screenshot from a video we took of us doing some experiments because they were complicated and we thought it would be fun to take a video. <laughs> But uh, Ramal took two weeks out of his busy life to show me how to do some experiments. Also, I didn't have time to show you those. Um, but it was really great, and I've appreciated the uh, guidance that Ramus has provided. Ramus has worked with HMS for years, and I think without him, I would not have been able to purify my HMS mutants for my experiments I showed you. Um, and then Andrew, who is a grad student in the lab now, also helped do some experiments for uh, my paper. Okay, I'm going to have to take some recent additions to the h &S support group. Christine, who's going to take over, I'm just going to do great. Um, and then Daniel, who did the simulations for me. I'm an honorary member of the h &S group. Um, and then I also have a bunch of people to thank for bioinformatics help because my project morphed into a bioinformatics project, like in the last year. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> but Jess and Kaylee and Kevin, you guys have all been so helpful and patient with me as I'm like, how do I type this command into Linux? So it's great, and helping me think about the right questions to be asking. I uh, also would not have made it without you guys, so thank you. Okay, so those are the HMS people, but the lab has been amazing. Um, I pulled out this picture. This is from 2012. This is my third day in the lab. <laughs> and most of me to taking the photo from the holiday card. And also Indro, he started like, you know, two days after I did, or before me or something. But these people, have been invaluable um, support. They've listened to me talk about things that didn't work. They cheered with me when my cleavage essay finally worked. And they have just been the best people and become some of my dearest friends. And I am grateful to have been around so many wonderful people. Um, I also need to thank my classmates who have been through this whole process with me um, from our awkward, like, we kind of don't really know each other at the zoo in our week one to being um, really close friends and people I feel like I could call anytime if I had questions um, about anything related to science or life in general. So they have been wonderful people and I'm grateful to know them. I also have to thank a bunch of my friends. <laughs> You was going to cry. Okay. <laughs> um, these friends have been wonderful people. Um, I would not have been able to make it through the many years of grad school without just like moral support and like you can do it. And some of those people have been in lab and some of them have been outside of lab, but they've helped me have fun when I am stressed and also been there to celebrate with me. And at a lot of weddings. There were a lot of weddings. <laughs> Um, I also have to thank my family, my parents. You guys were like, I don't know what you're doing, but have fun. <laughs> so thank you for that. And um, thank you for like, you know, bringing me to science stuff so at age 10 I could be like, I want to be a scientist. Here I am. So um, I also have to thank my new family, my in-laws. Hi guys. They're watching them. <laughs> Um, they have been just as supportive of me, um, even though they also don't know what I'm doing, but I appreciate all of their support, all the way from Florida. <clears throat> and my sister, who understands grad school, she got a master's and has been cheering me on um, through all these things. Okay, I finally have to thank my husband, who has listened to me be upset, who has listened to me be excited, and I probably would not have made it through grad school without you. So, thank you. Okay, with that, I'd like to take any questions that anybody has. So, um, you did the iron cleavage experiment on a hundred base pair piece of DNA. Yeah. So, I assume from what it looked like in your diagram, that that was the region of the anti-sense transcription 
or promoter within the legal office? Yes, it was, yeah. So that begs the question, did you ever do it in the presence of our employees and did it block completely? I did not try that experiment, no, but I think that would be a really interesting one. Um, so other people have done some footprinting experiments on other prom promoters that are regulated by h and and there's, it's really not clear, but there's maybe some changes in h and binding to DNA if RNA polymerase is there, but it also, there also might not be any changes in h and binding. So I think that's definitely a big question, and maybe the, the tethered cleavage assay would be a better way to get yeah, at that. Because in yeah. this case, you get a positive sign as yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. Which requires full Yeah, absolutely. This is all easy. Um, this is the part I know. But the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. So this is all in each other, right? So yeah. you're doing in vivo work, shit, and whatnot. Yeah. Can you, one, have you done HHA? And then two, can you look at the chip and determine if it's a linear or a bridge? Do you do some patterns? Those are great questions, Kevin, and I wish I had answers to them. So there's one, uh, so about the HHA chip. One group looked at HHA chip uh, where HHA was expressed from a plasmid. So it was overexpressed, um, and it seemed to bind in any um, HNS filament, but in actuality, there's not enough HHA for it to bind in all of the HNS filaments. So um, it's still unclear how HHA interacts with HNS in vivo. Um, and as to the bridge versus linear, that is like the golden question. And I think that it's hard to tell from just the chip experiments if it is a bridged or linear filament. Um, I think some other kind of like chip plus something else, or like the high C types experiments, people have thought maybe those could enlighten whether they're bridged or linear. Um, but I think it's, nobody's done that yet. And it's, I think, a source of much debate as what the woman matters like. There's a linear camp and a bridged camp, and everybody's like fighting about it. And if we could identify, like, there's bridged and linear filaments in the cell, things maybe could be resolved. So, okay. Uh, my question is a little bit more conceptual about the yeah. horizontal gene transfer. Yeah. And so, you said that all of this HNS binding is sort of to silence the genes that yeah. it's picking up in case they're dangerous. Yeah. So, what does this cell do? How does it decide to keep something or not keep something? Or like, how does it get rid of the HMS? Is it just a matter of time or? Yeah, so there's a variety of ways that um, cells have evolved to basically de-repress HMS silence genes. Um, and I think some of those have, they've just like evolved over time where, okay, this gene doesn't seem to be detrimental from like basal level expression. Um, so there's a bunch of factors um, called counter silencers that can displace these HMS filaments or some elongation factors can aid, I, we think, transcription through the filaments. So I think there's a few ways they evolve based on whatever the, the gene is. Yeah. I do have another Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this one is more about when you were looking at the big operator. It seemed yeah. like there were two HMS binding sites. There are. And do you need both? For it to form one filament or the other? Did you try eliminating one and seeing if you had a, a preferential formation of certain filaments? So I did not do um, I did not do any experiments directly looking at that. Um, but Karen Schnitz, her group looked at these two binding sites to determine which one was basically required for gene silencing. And I think both of them are required to form some filament. In vivo, we again don't know which one it is, um, but I think it was, if both of them were there, there was like more gene silencing, right, more repressed than if you just had one or the other. So, yeah, we don't know what filament is actually forming on them. So, if there are no more questions, um, let's thank Beth um, again for a very nice seminar. portion of that thesis defense, especially when we meet with her committee.